Welcome, thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. Today we're going to do something with my Lelia Neo Kautskiana or Kautskiai. And the obvious is repot her and put her into the setup that she much, much more prefers. Very rarely in Europe do we get our Rapiculus Lelias in the media that they prefer, which is rocky stones, pebbles, anything like that. They always come in bark. So not only is this orchid not potted up the right way, but she also has to transition from what she's accustomed to, which is the bark, to get into what I want her to be in, which is ceramics and lava rock. But there's another little thing I want to point out. Having had this orchid now for maybe two, three weeks, I really don't remember, I've had a little look-see as to the Kautsky eyes preferences. And I was astounded. I have a whole entire list of Ropiculus Lelias that I can identify because I'm trying to collect them all. So this is the Kautskiana that I bought right here from Luke a while back. Look at her. She's doing okay, she could be doing better, but you know, these guys go through a tremendous amount of stress of shipping and then getting acclimated. It takes them a little while to get going. But look at her size, right? So this is my Kautskiana. Upon my research in trying to get a comprehensive Rapiculus Lelia list established so I know which ones I'm pending in my collection, I also found there is a Kautskiai, which is now this one, also known as Neo Kautskiai. However, further research tells me that Kautskiai is now Catlia Kautskiana. Do you see where I have an issue here? Either this Kautskiana that I have is a seedling, or <laughs> who are you? Because Kautskiai Kautskiana, we'll use those names interchangeably, is obviously a massive Rapiculus glalia with extremely long structures. And then this little one is like, you know, the standard kind of size. I would say medium. You can get them much, much smaller. But if this is supposed to be a Kautskiana, and this is classified as Catlia Kautskiana, then I really don't know who this is, and we'll just have to wait and see. So if during this repot, this cleanup, and the transition information that I hope to be able to provide you with, I use Kautskiana and Kautskiai interchangeably. Know that I mean Catlia Kautskiana because that is what now this orchid has been classified as. And that is my disclaimer for the rest of the video. I am so excited to get into that pot. So let's get down and into it and get this orchid cleaned up and settled into her proper preferred media. It really shouldn't be that difficult of a task. What I'm doing here now is just spraying down the sheaths of the pseudobulbs because I have every intention of removing them. Possibly not the latest growth though, but all this other scruffy stuff is gonna come off. Prior to this, I have soaked her in calcium and magnesium just to give her some strength because whatever happens now, it's gonna be relatively stressful. But I've given her plenty of time to acclimate into my climate here in Southern Spain. I've had her outside day and night. I've been watering her, taking care of her, and I thought what I saw was new roots coming or root tips growing, which is perfect to get her out of the bark, out of organic and into the inorganic. That is really, really quite necessary no matter which orchid, if you're gonna transition, even if you're transitioning from inorganic into organic, any change of media, doesn't matter which one, you need to make sure that the orchid is growing new roots just to be on the 100% safe side. And yes, I wasn't mistaken. Let me just see. Wow, okay. Now, I had no intention of putting a support in this pot, but I may need to interrupt what I'm doing. She may need a support, but let's have a look at what she's already got to offer us and what we can work with before we make that decision. This is what I've been waiting for. I've been looking at the surface just to make sure that my timing is correct. Yeah, I like that. And you see these roots here? They're spent, but there's one in here somewhere that doesn't look as though it is completely gone right here. So we'll get the bark off and we'll get her cleaned up. And just in case we need it, I'm going to get a support. 
There we go. We're going to work with something like this. I really don't want anything permanent support wise in this orchid. And it's just going to be a simple matter of trimming off the dead roots. Normally, I would say I'm going to leave these on for anchoring, but I would still need a support because she's very, very top heavy. The new root tips that are growing must not move or suffer any abrasions while the orchid is growing those root tips. As generous as a root grower this appears to be, because I can see quite a lot of dead roots in the back, they failed simply because of the stress, the dry period during shipping, all kinds of things, because these Lelias normally are shipped bare root. So they will fail on their root front very, very quickly. And you sometimes you're starting off with nothing. Now, not using these for anchoring, is because I want her to be in my pot for a very, very long time. Another characteristic of Rapiculus Lelias is do not disturb. You might as well put them in a pot and just leave them. And that is the beauty of having these orchids in your collection because the inorganic media is not going to break down. So you can leave a Rapiculus Lelia easily in a pot for <laughs> decades as long as she doesn't grow out of the pot or break the pot, because that's another thing that they can do. They are incredibly tough and they can actually break their pots that they are in simply because a pot ages during time, but they are also very, very robust on the root front. And Dum Dum here just cut off a beautiful, beautiful, fresh root. Okay. Got to be more slow and more careful. I still have backup to work with. Now, ideally, when you're transitioning an orchid, any orchid, either way, into a different setup, a different media, anything like that, you want to get rid of any of the old media that the orchid came with so that the climate in the pot is as you want it to be. And as we are going into inorganic media, it also becomes a little bit more important to get rid of any organic media, which could rot on us in the subsequent years. Really, ideally, we don't want a lot of rot happening in our pots too quickly. If I cannot remove all the bark, what I'm going to do is just leave it because I've already destroyed one good root. I don't want to risk making the same mistake again. As with any orchid, roots are precious. They have top priority. But if I can get as much of this media off, that means I am reducing the risk of decay in my pot. So that is why I am pedantic about it. If, for example, I leave several bark pieces on a root, if that does decay, then it's okay because these Rapiculus Lelias also thrive and, you know, live in between decayed matter. It's just a question of getting the right balance. You don't want too much organic media in a pot if you're switching to inorganic. If you were switching from inorganic to organic media, it doesn't matter how much of the inorganic media stays on the roots if you're moving it back to bark, seeing as it won't break down. But going this route, it is important to try and be diligent and get the organic off. Now, also, while I work with an orchid that is new to my collection, I always take like a mental note of the characteristics of the root system. This one is very, very brittle. In my attempt, to get this piece of bark off, I cracked this long root right here. So the question now is, do I continue or do I leave that piece of bark on? It's far too big. I don't like it. I don't like it. I'm going to try and give this another go. If it was a small piece of bark like that down there, I wouldn't be so fussed about it. But I don't like this piece of bark being so big. There we go. Thank goodness for that. Here's another very big piece of bark. It's brittle so I can actually break it off as opposed to trying to pry it off with a knife. The question is, can I get the other piece off without any issues? Let's have a look, see. 
because if there are issues, this is not a big piece of bark. There's not a lot of organic media left on this orchid that would cause me to think, yeah, it's too much. That one big piece of bark, yeah, that did bother me. This little stuff here now doesn't bother me at all. And if it doesn't fall off between now and the repot, it's staying on. Now I'm also going to just be peeling off the velamen, having made that mistake with cutting off that one nice root. Just going to peel off the excess velamen here, leaving just the dead steely. There we go. And ideally, I want to get rid of all the sheaths as well. The reason now for me to remove the sheaths is just aesthetics. There's another reason, however, and that is I will know which part of the orchid came to me from jump because those growths are clean. And then I can also document its progress a little bit better, knowing that the new growths that have sheaths on them are mine. Now with this big orchid, I may in future be peeling off its sheaths because it's very, very easy. I don't normally do that on my Rapiculus Lelias that are tiny because the damage can be done very, very quickly to any structures of the small Rapiculus Lelias by being too fussy about getting sheaths off. We can also talk about the fact that, you know, your pest assessment is much, much easier when the sheaths are off. But during the years of owning an orchid, you also get a better understanding anyway about pest assessment because you're observing them a lot more often. You're watching, you're looking out for them. So this for me is mainly just aesthetics at this point and a future reference. And that is why I mentioned previously that I wasn't sure if I was going to take the new growth here that it came with, take those sheaths off because that new growth is relatively young. It has yet to mature its bulb and its structure in the back. So I may just leave that on. Another thing I do is I always start peeling my sheaths off that are complete all the way up the structure. I start at the base. This way I'm taking off the outer layers first and working my way to the innermost layers, which is always at the top of the structure. Should there be an eye hiding underneath, I am not stripping the top all the way down, which would take out the outer layers as well but the outer layers are also tougher. It will also take out a new growth, a new eye, anything that's going on down here, including root nubbins. So I work my way from the base up as best as possible. Seeing as the growths here are so tightly bound together, very, very stringy and hay-like as well, these sheaths. I may not get the squeaky, squeaky clean look, but at least for reference purposes and observation purposes, it'll be a darn slight better than leaving them on, looking like they've just come out of the pampas. Normally I do this over the kitchen sink with a toothbrush, which is very rarely documented because, you know, kitchen. <laughs> but yeah. If you find yourself in this situation, kitchen sink, toothbrush. If you have clean water, perfect. I don't have clean water coming out of my faucet, so I use RO water. Okay, so this lower sheath is coming off quite nicely all of its own accord. So see that root tip? We're going to just be gentle about it. I mean, if you want to come off that easily, I'm going to take you off. And also, again, it's the outermost layer at the bottom part of the structure. Toothbrush is very, very handy to get into the little crevices of the pseudobulbs here. But I also need to rinse the toothbrush because these hairy bits of the sheath get into the toothbrush. And well, that's all a bit cumbersome doing it out here if I were to bring in a toothbrush, but yeah, always works great. Toothbrushes are not just for cleaning teeth. <laughs> All right, I'm just assessing the root system. 
what can I get off? Just making sure that I've looked at everything very, very closely. Also taking mental reference of the characteristic of the roots. If you find yourself in the position of repotting a Kalkskiana, then know that the root system is extremely brittle, which one could possibly say about every Rapiculus lalia, but uh, not really. Some roots really have a toughness to them. They're not that sensitive. This one in a range of not sensitive to sensitive for a Rapiculus lalia, I would say ranks up there at around a mark of eight as a grade, so to speak, 10 being sensitive and one being tough. So the Kautskiana, yep, an eight in my opinion. I'm just making a mental note of that information for future reference. And the best time to stop with a cleanup is if you are in actual fact happy. The moment you start going, as in my case, I would love to now just fiddle and fuss. It's also a beautiful afternoon, but the moment you start going a little bit above and beyond what you are comfortable with, that is when more mistakes happen. So I am pretty pleased with her current state. This is good enough for me. I could do more around here, but it won't change a single thing for what I'm trying to achieve with this orchid, transitioning her into the media of my choice and what her preference would be. So we're done. Stop while you're ahead, so to speak. Keeping in mind the first mistake of this gorgeous root, that was carelessness. So we're gonna stop right here and not repeat a mistake. Okay, so I've put a support into this pot only like halfway up. Underneath, I have crocked with lecker just to fill up the pot. No other reason. Every other media that's going into this pot is very, very wicking. It's just so that I can fill up the pot with the media that isn't as valuable as the ceramis I have in here now. So this is ceramis of all sizes. No distinguishing. You can see little pieces. You can see chunky pieces. The point being that she has access to a lot, a lot of water when she needs it. There is no drying out of the media, so to speak. Her roots are pretty long already, so we'll make a little bit of a well. And this is where I now have to make sure that I get her height right. and this wire out of the way. There we go. Try to unkink the roots as best as possible. And yes, she is bang in the middle. And then I'm gonna fill around all of this with ceramis, just around the root system. You can also use small lava rock, which I will use as a top dressing. And I prefer to work with dry ceramis. It doesn't stick to the hands as much. It falls into place much more evenly as well. And then just top dress with lava rock. And in this case, I have medium to large size lava rock because in proportion with the orchid, that one leaf really wants to be the star of the show, hey? Gotta watch that one root tip right there. So I'm gonna be placing some lava rock just to cover it. Anything else that falls on top now, it has sort of like a little pocket of protection there. Because ideally, I'd like to stabilize my orchid with the help of the lava rock around the base. Just so that I don't have to tie her up like some kind of a wire mummy, so to speak. <laughs> Let's turn her around, get that leaf out of the way. Now, in the past, I used to top dress with sand. This orchid doesn't need sand. She's a big one. She's got plenty of access to moisture and humidity around her roots with all that ceramis. The sand I used to put in because I was simulating crevices, nooks and crannies of the rocky outcrops where they live. This orchid clearly is not a proper rocky outcrop kind of dweller. 
She is far too big. She would probably be ripped out of any outcrop cliff face just by her size. So she's on flat, flat land. And that's why there is no sand going in here now. But what we are going to do is we are going to give her something to really boost her along a little bit further. That's another good dose and helping of calcium and magnesium. I'm going to fill the pot up all the way to the top. Prior to this repot, she was already soaking in calcium, magnesium and seaweed. Now I'm just going to drench that media one more time and now she can get her root grow on. It goes without saying that this growth here is annoying me, but if I try to pull it up to the support here, the whole orchid tilts. So until she's not entirely rooted in, this growth will be sticking out the way it is. But where she lives, she's not going to be interfered with anymore at all. The only way I need to water this orchid is by flushes. But you can see the difference between the two, right? I am convinced that this is Catlia Kautskiana, as they say in the books now. Then I would like to know who this is, because she was bought as Catlia Kautskiana. And clearly, <laughs> There's a big difference here, not just because the pseudobulbs also are a maroon Bordeaux color, whereas the pseudobulbs here, it's nothing to do with how much sun exposure she has. There's a big difference in the color. <laughs> All fun and games with these little repiculous lelias. But anyway, I'm going to put the little one back on its shelf, but the big Kautskiana is going to enjoy some very late afternoon sun. She's been living here since her arrival, just on the lower shelf, but for the remainder of the evening, she can enjoy a little bit of that beautiful, balmy afternoon sun and really start living la vida here in southern Spain. Hope you found this interesting, helpful, if nothing else, entertaining. Once more, thank you so much for your time. Any questions you may have on thoughts I did not circle back to, please address those in the comments. I'll be happy to have a dialogue because this just so happens to be one of my favorite, favorite topics. Repiculous Lelias, have a beautiful day. On one condition, please, that you stay safe. Look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care. Bye.